Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter one. If you didn't bring your Bible with you this morning, uh, in front of you, there should be some Bibles placed in the pew. You're more than welcome to grab those and follow along with me. I want you guys to be able to see this for yourself. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading this morning in verse number 46. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And when you found your place this morning, I invite you to please stand with me as we honor God's word by reading. The Bible says this, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Let's go to the Lord and ask for his help this morning. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for giving us this chance to come as we are uh, seeking to build excitement and anticipation for Christmas. Uh, Lord, I do thank you for uh, this time of year. Uh, not for the surface level things that we try to prop our life and our hearts up with. Our hearts are way too heavy for that. Lord, thank you for propping our hearts up with your word, which is sufficient to sustain us. I pray, Lord, that you would provide us with a good meal this morning from your word. Uh, we could see uh, the truth found there, therein. Uh, but, Lord, even more importantly, as we look at this, section of your word, uh, and we see how Mary praised you, how she worshiped, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to look at that, and you would reveal things in, in this passage this morning, uh, and help us to evaluate if, if how we are worshiping is biblical, if it's true, if we're truly worshiping in a way that honors you. Um, maybe it's in a way that hasn't, uh, maybe it's not a popular way I pray that we would do it in a biblical way uh, by the book. Uh, Lord, help us this morning. Uh, maybe there are some that showed up this morning or maybe even listen online that are still looking. They've, they've got answers. Uh, they're going through life with a lot of uh, questions, and, and they need answers. I pray they would find them this morning in your word and in your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, church family, you can be seated. Now, last week we talked a little bit about Mary, and uh, we talked about who she was, and we talked about the very best birth announcement that's ever happened in the history of the world, uh, and now we're talking about how Mary responds uh, here in Luke chapter 1. And I want to remind you guys before we go on that what we just read is about a 13-year-old girl who had no personal copy of God's Word. Like most everyone during that time, they, they didn't have God's Word to just sit in their lap and to, to read of a morning. No, the only scripture she would have ever heard would have been in the synagogue as it was read to her. Yet, her praise is biblical. And so we're going to look at that here this morning. We're going to look at how Mary worshipped. Uh, we're also going to learn about why she worshipped and why you and I should worship. Um, in fact, the New Testament places a heavy emphasis on worship, so we need to learn how. Um, we're going to learn why the Bible encourages worship. Uh, I'm going to remind you guys this morning, many of you guys already know this, but it's a good reminder, that the way God made you, the way God wired you was to worship. You were wired to worship. God created us to worship Him. But the problem is, 
many of us default to a different kind of worship. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. Because we need to understand this. The object of our worship determines where we will spend eternity. Who you worship and how you worship depends on where you will be when you breathe your last breath. When your old heart stops beating, who you worship will determine where you go. And you will go somewhere. It's not the end. You will be in one of two places. Heaven, to spend with Christ, or hell, that's what the Bible says, a place you will um, suffer eternal punishment with no hope of relief. But, but how you worship and who you worship determines where you will go. You see, Romans chapter 1 tells us that the default, the precept of sinful man is to worship other things besides the Creator. The man who has never had his heart changed defaults to worshiping other things. We call this idolatry. We call this worshiping idols. Because what is an idol? You know, some of you guys here this morning, you say, well, I'm no idol worshiper. We're talking about worship. Well, what does it mean to worship? An, an idol, let me remind you guys, is not necessarily carved out of stone or wood or metal. An idol can be anything. Uh, position, power, pleasure, all of those things can also be an idol in our life. A truck, a boat, a house, a person, a relationship, all those things. If you put that in the place of a holy God, that's idolatry. But some of you guys say, well, I don't, I don't do that. I want, to, I want you to keep in the back of your mind, idolatry is not just worshiping a thing or something else other than God. Idolatry is also attempting to worship God in the wrong way. So some of us may say, well, I worship God. But you're still committing idolatry because you're doing it in the wrong way. Let me give you some examples this morning of how not to worship. <laughs> you might want to write this down. These are some Old Testament examples of how people worship the wrong way. First example this morning was, uh, you guys remember Moses. Everybody say Moses. I know you're still awake. All right. See, Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God. While he was up there, he was interrupted because the people were committing idolatry. They were worshiping the wrong way. The Bible says this in Exodus chapter 32, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned quickly aside from the way which I commanded them, for they have made themselves a molten or a golden calf, and they're worshiping it and have sacrificed it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, a lot of people are saying they sinned by, by carving out an image and worshiping it. But listen to this. A step further and a, and a deeper look at Exodus 32 shows us they weren't worshiping a false god. They were worshiping the god that delivered them out of Egypt, but they were worshiping him in the wrong way. There's a lot of people who know the Lord, but they worship him the wrong way. They committed the sin just like the Israelites there in Exodus 32. Let me give you another example if you're taking notes this morning. Another example, later on, God would give them a prescription of how they were to worship. But listen to what the Israelites did. The high priest of Israel had a son, two sons called Nadab and Abihu. Some of you guys, maybe you're expecting, you're looking for a name. Let me make those suggestions this morning. Adab and Abihu. I guarantee you nobody else in and around the state has that name. Uh, but anyways, these two boys were going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, but, but they didn't do it the way God prescribed. Listen to what the Bible says. They offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. They went ahead and did what they wanted instead of what the Lord said. And in Leviticus 10, verse number 2, listen to what the Bible says. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. 
So they worshiped the wrong way. Did God take it serious? Well, absolutely he did. He burned them up. Another example of don't do this uh, is a story about Samuel and Saul. See, King Saul is sitting back with his army and he's watching the Philistines and he's becoming fearful. The Philistine army is making advancements towards the Israelites and, and King Saul becomes fearful. The high priest told Saul, he said, now you wait on me. You wait seven days before you go and do battle with these Philistines. This is 1 Samuel chapter 10. But then Saul sees these people making their way towards him, making, and they're getting closer and closer. And he says, hey, wait a second. We can just go ahead and worship the Lord without the high priest. We can, we can just get this over with and go ahead and, and, and take care of this battle. And he starts justifying things in his mind. And listen to what he says. He says, the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked favor of the Lord. And so he forced himself, and the king offered burnt offerings without the high priest. Now, this was a big no-no in the Old Testament. And what happened was it cost him everything. 1 Samuel chapter 13, the high priest shows up, and he says, Samuel said to Saul, You've acted foolishly. You did not keep the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. You could have been, your lineage could have been king forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man because he has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. One more example before we move on to Mary. Another example of unlawful worship took place in the Old Testament. They were transporting the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. This is the thing that housed the Ten Commandments. God had a way that this thing was supposed to be carried. It was supposed to be carried with poles. But these guys got in a hurry, and you know what they did? They brought an ox and a cart, and they just loaded the thing up and started taking it back to Jerusalem. Well, the thing was kind of, uh, I don't know if this is a Kentucky word, in North Carolina we call it cattywampus, like it just, it's going to fall over. Some of you guys have never heard that word. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that word. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Some of you guys are looking at me like, I don't know what he's saying. But anyways, they load up this Ark of the Covenant, and it starts to fall over. And a man reaches out to try to stabilize the Ark, and listen what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Uzzah, again a great name, reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. Now Uzzah just thought he was trying to do the right thing. Stay, don't let it fall over. But what does this teach us? God doesn't accept any alterations for the way he tells us we should worship. He takes it seriously. So you've seen examples already thus far of the way people have done it wrong. So what is true worship? What, what are the two components of true worship? Well, the Bible tells us this in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, that we must worship two things, in spirit, and we're also to worship in truth. If you desire to worship the Lord the correct way, it has to contain two things. It has to contain the Spirit, and it also has to be done in truth. You see, worship is not just an outward ritual. Worship has to be genuine. It has to line up with God's Word. I want to... I want to give you some helpful points as we move on talking about worship. And the first thing that we need to see about true worship is a true worshiper must be controlled by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? According to Acts chapter 4, verse 32, only a believer, only a saved man or woman or child can truly worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. A lost man does not have the ability to worship the Lord in the correct way until he calls out to the Lord in faith. 
if you desire, well, let me say this. Sometimes we look around at our community, we look around globally, and we say, well, why don't people worship the Lord? Well, the number one reason why people don't worship the Lord is because they don't know the Lord, because they don't have a relationship with Him. Their heart is naturally bent on worshiping themselves instead of worshiping Him. So, number one, if you want to worship the Lord, then your heart has to be changed. And we're going to talk about that more here in just a second. Let me move on. Worshiping in the Spirit requires that our thoughts must be focused on God. You want to worship the Lord the right way, then something has to happen. True worship of the Lord is fueled by this book. When we read God's Word, when we study God's Word, when we think about God's Word, we call that meditating, when we think about God's Word, that turns the faucet on in which worship flows from. You see, many times we don't worship the Lord because we don't know Him. We're not in this book. We wonder why our worship life is stagnant. It's because we don't crack open the book. It sits on the dash of our truck, and it gathers dust until next Sunday. Then we wipe it off, come in and open it, in the time we have here this morning. True worship is fueled by God's Word. And so let me encourage you, if you desire to worship the, the Lord more fully, you desire to be faithful, then I'd encourage you to spend time in this book. And it's not just something where you turn on the news, you're sitting there watching WDRB, and you open your Bible up, and you're sipping your coffee, or I don't know what you do. That's not undivided time alone with the Lord. You're going to have to get away from the kids. You're going to have to get away from the noise and the distraction and turn off Facebook and fill in the blank your favorite social media. You want, to be, you want your worship to be fueled? You're going to have to be quiet and read and listen and, and spend time with the Lord. Our thoughts have to be focused undividedly on the Lord. Psalm 86, verse number 11. You might want to write that down. Let me continue on. True worship in the Spirit, as prescribed in John chapter 4, is done. Well, let me say this. True worship in the Spirit requires repentance. Now, let me explain that. You see, whenever we have unconfessed sin in our heart, it hinders our fellowship and communion with the Lord. You may show up on Sunday morning, or, or you show up to your wherever you spend time with the Lord, and, and maybe there's, there's sin in your heart. Maybe you've been engaging in fill-in-the-blank sin. Maybe you've been talking bad to your spouse. Or, or maybe you've been looking at pornography. Or, or maybe you're, uh, I don't know, maybe you're stealing something from work. Or There's some sort of unconfessed sin in your life, and then you show up on Sunday morning, and you're like, man, I ain't getting nothing out of this. Well, the reason why is because sin is disrupting the relationship between you and the Holy God. Sin is what separated us from God. We have to confess that sin and, and, and repent of it. Repent means, hey, I'm heading in this direction. I'm engaging in this sin. I'm not even sorry for it. But repentance is turning from that and turning back to the Lord, to His Word, His way, and His will. So if you want to worship the Lord, confess your sin. That's why David said this. In Psalm 139, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Every time you show up and you crack open your Bible, that's one of the first things that you should do. Lord, is there anything in my heart that I need to confess? And he will reveal it to you. You want to spend intimate time with the, with the Lord? And confess your sins. So not only is worship in spirit, but it's also in truth. What do I mean by that? True worship is consistent with Scripture. God only accepts worship that's consistent with Scripture. If people are, uh, this actually happened in the, church, in the church of Corinth. If people are running around a sanctuary cursing God, or they're doing things that aren't biblical, we know that's not consistent worship. 
In order to worship the Lord consistently, it has to line up with the Word. All right, now that was a preview. Some of you guys are like, man, that was an introduction. All right, we're going to get to some more meat. This is really important because what I want you guys to see in this Christmas season is that Mary is a very good example of how we should worship the Lord. Well, how so? Because she modeled humble, true, acceptable worship. Now, I know between last week and this week, you guys have slept. There have been a lot on your mind. But I also understand we skipped a few verses between last week and this week. And there's a reason for that. Now, what has happened is the angel Gabriel, back here in verse number, hmm, verse number 26, came from God and announced to Mary that she's going to have a baby. Shortly thereafter, guess what Mary did after she received the birth announcement? She packed up and went to visit one of her relatives by the name of Elizabeth. And uh, Elizabeth at that point was six months pregnant with a little boy by the name of John the Baptist. Now, while Mary was there with Elizabeth, God used that time to erase doubts in her mind, to confirm uh, and strengthen her faith. And so what we have, I hope you still got your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1. If you'll notice, in verses 46 through 55, it's in italics. What that means is, as Mary is thinking through what's been told to her, she just bursts out in praise and worship. We call verses 46 through 55 the Magnificat. It's, it's a very special, uh, I guess you could say, it's, it's Mary's commentary, it's her praise to the Lord. And that's what we're studying here this morning. I want to show you a few things we learned from this passage as we move on. Number one, I want us to see the attitude of worship. L let's notice Mary's attitude for worship, and then let's look at our attitude towards worship and evaluate it. So notice this, in verse number 46, the Bible says this, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Notice in verse 46 that worship is internal. There's two words that tell us that here in this passage. Uh, we have two words, her soul and her spirit. That encompasses everything inside of us. It involves our whole inner being, our mind, our emotion. And our will, all those things in Mary's life come together. Her mind, her emotion, her will come together in an out, like an orchestra coming together in order to, to praise the Lord. If you desire true worship of the Lord, those three components have to come together. Your mind has to be focused on the Lord. Your will must be focused on God's will. Everything, your emotions must be focused on the Lord. That is what true worship looks like. But the sad thing is, if we look around us, we don't see a lot of true worship. We see a lot of shallow worship. People not using their minds, they just sit there and say the same words over and over as they sing songs. That's shallow. But when we use our mind and we listen, let me say this before we move on. Shallow worship is external. And it's ritualistic. We're just, again, doing the same things over and over. Isaiah 29, verse 13 says this. This people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Shallow worship talks about God, but it doesn't really do what God says. Ezekiel 33, verse number 31 says, these people sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after gain. True worship involves not just our mouths opening, it's our hearts opening as well. It's not just external, hey, I'm standing, I'm worshiping. No, it involves everything on the inside as well. Let's move on. True worship isn't just internal. True worship is also intense. 
to verse number 46. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. This original word in the Greek uh, for magnifies, it, it literally means to make great. It means to, uh, to glorify, to praise. True worship of the Lord is not necessarily uh, staged. True worship is spontaneous. It's a personal experience that happens in the individual life of a believer, in the innermost heart. True worship is heartfelt, it's not artificial. Now, some of you guys are here this morning, and you've been to a lot of different churches over the course of your life. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about artificial worship, where they, they, they set the stage, uh, they, they, it's just so cookie cutter, everything's just so hemmed in. It feels like you took a wet blanket and just put over the whole church. That's not, that's not true worship. You see, true worship is not man-centered. It's not about a preacher. It's not about who's singing in the, in the choir or who's doing special music. True worship is God-centered rather than self-centered or man-centered. True worship is mental just as much as it is emotional. There's been a lot of services I've been in over the course of my life. It was just a big emotional fest. And then at the end, there's just no substance there. People made decisions just based on emotion, not using their mind and logic. And that's wrong. True worship seeks to honor God, not manipulate Him. You know, there's a lot of people that show up to worship in many churches all across America who ask the question, hey, what am I going to get out of this worship service? What can I get out of it? They're seeking, well, look at verse number 46. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My Mary was seeking to magnify, to glorify the Lord. She wasn't there to magnify herself or, or to fill herself up. That's why we show up to worship. That's why we show up and open our Bibles on a Monday morning. It's not to magnify ourselves. It's to magnify the Lord, to glorify Him. Understand this. True worship is not an experience Experience that can be manufactured with lights, with fog machines, with screwing pallets to the wall. That's not, that's not worship. That's a stage. That's a production. Let's keep going. What else is genuine worship? Not only is it internal, not only is it intense, true worship is also habitual. It's just part of life. True worship is in the everyday. Again, how do we know this? Verse number 46. If you look in your Bibles at verse 46, it probably uses one of two words. It says, my soul exalts. Raise your hand if your Bible says that. All right, so you, raise your hand if your Bible says magnifies. All right. So both of those two words uh, come from the same Greek word, but it, it's in the present tense form which tells us that this wasn't just one time that Mary glorified the Lord. It was a continual pattern in her life. She's continually worshiping the Lord. Why does this matter? Why do I point this out? Because I want you guys to understand that worship in your life doesn't just take place on a Sunday morning. Worship in your life should be habitual. But also understand this. Understand that worship is a choice. Like, you choose to worship the Lord. It's not just something that's just going to happen. Understand this. Circumstances also should not affect our worship. You shouldn't say, well, I'm going to go worship the Lord because it's been, a, it's been a great week. And then the next week, things are bad. I'm not going to worship the Lord today. Do you know why we don't do that? Because circumstances are constantly changing. But God, His purpose and His plan and His person, they do not change. So we should always worship the Lord. You show up on Sunday morning, 
consistently, habitually, not because, hey, my schedule's open. No, you do it because God is worthy of your worship. The reason why you wake up tomorrow morning and read your Bible, it's not because you just feel good or you got up on, at a good time. It's because habitually God deserves that worship. I wrote this down in my study this past week, and the Lord reminded me of it. December the 17th, 2017, I was studying this passage, getting ready to deliver it to Raymond Baptist Church. You see, the night before, which would have been December the 16th, 2017, uh, there was a church member that had a heart procedure up in Louisville. Some of you guys may remember who it was. I got the phone call late Saturday night. And you guys know, late Saturday night is not a time that I like to be out. I like to have my mind focused, getting ready for Sunday morning. We were like 7.30 when I received this phone call that church members in Louisville. And so I told him, I said, we're going to make a jammy run, load the kids up. We're going to Louisville. I need to make this visit. Now, normally I wouldn't do this. But the Lord really led me. I just knew I needed to go make this visit. So we ended up in Louisville. Kids stayed in the car with Emily in the parking garage. I ran in right quick to visit a church member. We talked, and uh, she was so very sweet. Uh, she said, now, Brother Travis, basically she shared her testimony with me. She was praising the Lord. It's hard circumstance, but she's ready to get back to church ready to get back to normal life. It was around 5 o'clock sun, that Sunday morning that I got a phone call, and it was that Miss Francis had uh, died of a uh, blood clot. I mean, just hours after our visit, she had passed away. The Lord had took her, took her home. And so I'm studying this passage about worship, and I'm studying about how circumstances don't change. We consistently worship the Lord. doesn't matter if things are bad. doesn't matter if things are good. Doesn't. And so here I am, and I just, man, I'm not an emotional person, but I just lost it. Some of you guys may not remember it, but that Sunday morning, I was just, I was a wreck. Because the Lord was teaching me in the trenches of ministry how worship is not conditional on how we feel we worship the Lord no matter what's going on. A couple of years ago, well, probably hasn't even been two years now, uh, the Lord brought me back to this passage, and I'm reading it, I'm studying it, still not got to deliver this yet. And uh, Emily was having some health problems. We thought possibly she was miscarrying with Henry. And that was on Sunday morning. Can you guys remember that? Again, an emotional wreck. I get in the pulpit, preach. And then, here is this past week, and I'm like, man, maybe I can finally deliver this sermon. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for the roof to cave in, something crazy to happen, but here we are. And I can say experientially, that we need to worship the Lord. doesn't matter what's went on the past week. We worship the Lord because His purposes, His promises, and His salvation are fixed. Though the seas and the billows of life are going up and down, up and down, it feels like this is how we're living our life, we're anchored to Christ who is immovable. He never changes. So we can continue worshiping him. Psalm 16, verse number 8 says this. I have set the Lord continually before me. No matter what was going on, we constantly worship the Lord. I, I pray that's the case for your life. I know in my life, in the past, I have failed at that. I pray that the Lord would continue to work in my heart. I want to move on to our next. Notice also genuine worship is also marked by humility. You see, a proud person cannot worship God because they're too busy worshiping themselves. See, the Bible says this. This is the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. 
God alone deserves our affection. He alone deserves our praise. He alone deserves our attention. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In order to properly worship the Lord, our hearts must be marked by humility. Now, what is that? It's the opposite of proud. A humble person understands that they deserve nothing. Well, I just don't deserve it. A humble person understands they don't deserve to draw their very next breath. They don't deserve salvation. They mourn their sin. They understand that their spiritual bank account is way overdrawn on their own. They have a deep gratitude towards the Lord that results in in worship. That's Mary. That's exactly where she was at. She was humble. She understood that she needed God's grace and Mary needed God's mercy. And so that resulted in praise. You see, a lot of people, and we talked about this last week, go online if you want to look at it. We talked about Mary. Mary is not this sort of exalted queen from heaven as many denominations make her out to be. She was just a, a sinner in need of God's grace. She viewed herself as a lowly bondservant. Look at this. Verse 48. It says, For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant." Socially, Mary was just a little girl from an insignificant village. I mean, she was basically a nobody. Even after becoming the mother of the Messiah, she didn't become famous. I mean, Jesus treated her with respect, but she she was just a normal lady. This rise in popularity with Mary, this infatuation about her saying she was sinless and all this, Understand, Mariology, that's what we call it, didn't come about until around the 14th century. Even the early church didn't didn't prop her up. It didn't elevate her to a position. She was just an ordinary young woman engaged to a very ordinary young carpenter. She was humble. But her humble estate, as we read about here in verse 48, had more to do than just her social standing in Jewish culture. It also had to do with where she stood spiritually, her spiritual character. She had a high view of the Lord, and she had a low view of self. That's where worship begins. Seeing ourselves in life who God is. We are so unworthy. We constantly do wrong. But God is pure. He is holy. He has done that which we could never do. Listen to this. Isaiah 57, verse number 15. Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. So, Mary's view of her unworthiness led her to praise, because she's praising the Lord from a grateful heart. What needs to happen in the life of every single person is for you to view yourself for who you truly are, apart from Christ. You're a sinner. You need God's grace. And whenever you begin to understand how much of a sinner you are, that will motivate you towards praising the Lord for the way that he's provided through Jesus Christ. All right. So we've seen the attitude for worship here this morning. Let's move on to number two. These points go a lot faster. You guys can say thank you. All right, number two. Don't really say it, but the attitude for worship. Now number two, the object of worship. What is Mary worshiping? Look at verse 47. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. And then notice those next two words which again clarifies Mary was not sinless. She says, my Savior. Mary needed a Savior. She focused her worship towards the one who would save her. You see, you and I, the focus of our worship should be on the Savior as well. Christ, has not just met your physical needs. Not only do you 
have a fridge full of groceries more than likely and shoes on your feet. You have a place to worship. But God's met your greatest need, the need for salvation, the need for forgiveness of sin. He met that through Jesus Christ. That's what fuels our worship. That's how the taint doesn't run dry. We focus on Christ. So we've talked about the attitude of worship. We've talked about the object of our worship, which is Christ. Number three, the reasons for worship. What motivated Mary to worship? It was everything that God had done for her. Mary praised the Lord for the opportunities that she had been given. She had the chance, the opportunity, to be the mother of the Messiah. So, again... One of the ways that Mary praised the Lord was thanking him for opportunities. Look at verse 49. For he who is mighty has has done great things for me, and his name is holy. But she doesn't just stop and praise the Lord for what he has done for her. She has moved past self. And then in verse 51, she begins to talk about what the Lord has done for other people as well. When we praise the Lord, we just... We don't just thank Him for saving us. We thank Him for saving our children or our parents or the great things He's doing in the life of believers all around the world. That's what we thank the Lord for. And then notice in verse number 50, you might even want to write this in your Bible, it says, And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Verse 50, Mary is quoting Psalm 103, verse number 17. So Mary, even though she didn't have her own copy of God's Word, she knew God's Word. She had listened to the tabernacle, hid God's Word in her heart. She praised God not only for her salvation, but also for the sal- salvation for all of those who would choose to accept it. Now, we got a few more verses, and then I'm headed towards an invitation. I want you to follow along with me, starting in verse 51. I want you to see what Mary is praising the Lord for, what the Lord has done in the past. It says, For he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. Again, Mary's praising the Lord at this point. 52 says, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. All right. That's Mary's Mary's praise. That's how she's praising the Lord. I want to remind you this morning. Every single person that's ever been born has been wired to worship. It's just a factory setting. I mean, you, you come with it. You were wired to worship the Lord. The question I have for you this morning, I can't answer this question. What are you worshiping? What does your mind, what do you spend your time thinking about? What do you spend your affections and your emotions on? Is it a person? Is it a job? Is it a desire? What are you worshiping? If it's anything besides the Lord, the Bible calls that idolatry. And idolatry is a sin. So the first step in getting back to worship the Lord is confessing that sin. Remember, sin hinders a relationship with God. What priority, I, I want to speak to believers here this morning, those of you that are saved, you know that you're saved, I want to ask you a real question this morning. What priority is worship in your life? Dads, who have been called as leaders of your home. What priority is worship in your home? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 
So let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. It says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day draw near. See, there were a lot of people who were pulling away from worship. You see, when it was fair weather, they were on the lake. When it was deer season, they were in the stand. When there was anything else of, that would draw their affections away, that's where they were. My question to you is, what role does worship play in your life and in your family? Now, this is, this is public worship. This takes place once a week, and this is important for you to be here. But what about daily worship? What priority is that in your life? I can guarantee you this. Your spiritual life will never rise above the amount of time you spend daily with the Lord. You can't expect to, to have faith and confidence in the Lord and be a soul winner and, and be fervent in evangelism if there is no worship taking place in your life on a daily basis. Don't expect it's just not going to happen. But if you spend time with the Lord, you're praying, you're reading the Word, then watch how the Lord uses His Word to shape your desires, to shape your will. Remember, as well, I'm speaking to believer and unbeliever at this point, understand the object of your worship will determine where you spend eternity. You say, man, I don't want to worship the Lord. I mean, I, I'll do it casually on Sunday morning, but the rest of the week I'm, you know, I'm okay with Christ being an add-on, but I don't want it to be all of my life. Understand that is not, there's no such thing. It's all or nothing. You're either with Christ or you're against Christ. So, again, who are you worshiping? If you're not worshiping the Lord, if you're not sold out for Him, don't expect to spend the eternity with Him. It's not just about praying a prayer and then you live your life the rest. No, it's it's lordship. You're submitting fully, 100% to him. Next question. You may be here this morning and say, I'm worshiping the Lord. Are you doing it in an unworthy way? Is your worship genuine, or is it just an outward ritual? You show up, you go through the motions, but your heart's not moved at all. Christian, you may ask you this question. When you do spend time with the Lord daily, is it uninterrupted? Does he really have your undivided attention? Or you just add it in to your daily... What I'm saying is it's so easy. It's a temptation life of a Christian. Hey, I'm just going to turn on this while I'm doing my job. But you really don't give the Lord your full attention. That's wrong. Is sin hindering your fellowship? If so, repent. Next question. And I hope we hear this one. And I hope this one goes out and is recorded. Are you participating in worship that's consistent with Scripture? There are a lot of churches out there that are not worshiping consistently with Scripture. There are a lot of churches that I can't go and worship in because they're not functioning biblically. I'll give you an example. If, if I go to a church and it's time for the pastor to come up and there's a woman comes into the pulpit to preach, it's done. It's over. It's not consistent with Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 3 tells us. I'm done. I mean, it's just, I might as well just walk out. Because I'm not going to be able to worship in that context that's not scripturally lined up with God's Word. The Lord won't bless it. Satan loves it, and Satan will draw a crowd. It's not consistent, genuine worship. Is your worship shallow? Is it habitual? Do circumstances affect your worship? I just don't really feel like going. It doesn't matter about your feelings. Habitually show up and worship the Lord. That's where you need to be. It's marked by humility. 
What are you praising the Lord for? This is my last question. Praise the Lord for what he's done in your life, but are you praising the Lord for what he's done in other people's lives? I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we've talked about a lot this morning. And it would be wrong if we just got up, sung a couple songs, and then we just leave. This morning, God is issuing an invitation. You you see, God has a free gift that he has extended to all man. But man has to choose to receive that gift. See, I cannot make you take the free gift of salvation that God extends to his son, Jesus Christ. I can't. If I could, I would. But if you're here this morning and you've never... Ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. If you've never confessed Him as not only Savior, but Lord of your life, if you've never believed on Him in faith, I encourage you to do that this morning. Open the free gift that's been extended to you. You see, there's no way you can worship, there's no way you can even want to worship until you cry out to the Lord in faith. It's not possible. You see, sin is standing between you and the Holy God. But God in His grace has sent a man by the name of Jesus Christ. And God knew that you couldn't live up to His standard. He knew it. So you know what He did? He sent His Son to live the life you should have lived. And He did. He did a perfect way. And Christ went to a cross. He died. And now He's offering His life for yours. He not only takes away your sin, but all the righteousness is now credited to your account. You're not only clean, you're not only at zero, not only has your debt been paid, but now you are looked at as a child of God, as an heir of Christ. That means you're looked at as royalty. How many times do we forget that? Friend, if you're here this morning and you never cried out to Christ in faith, I encourage you to do it in your own words. Ask him to save you, and he will. And I want to challenge those that are here this morning that are believers, who their worship is all messed up. It's focused on them and what they can get out of the service. Apply this biblical truth that we've talked about here this morning to your life. And allow the Lord to work. Confess your sin and ask him to renew your worship. Lord, I do pray for our church family this morning as we head into Christmas. I pray that you would continue to build excitement and and anticipation for the things that you're excited about us so that after Christmas has come and gone, we're still excited. We've not invested our time and our resources in, in temporal, earthly things, but we've invested in eternal things. We've invested in our children, something that will live past this earthly life. Please help us now. Draw us to a place where we're surrendered more fully to you. In Jesus' name we pray.